Hello, everyone from the Latin American region. I'm really happy to be here today to be able to provide this presentation. My name is Dr. Robert Bilkowski. Uh, I am going to be your lecturer today, and we're going to be talking about the topic of end tidal oximetry. Let me just switch over into uh, presentation mode. And we will be able to begin. So, like I said, principles of end tidal oximetry, which is a, a little different. Most people are more familiar with end tidal CO2, uh, but this is going to be the topic of end tidal oximetry, where there is some growing evidence uh, that helps to identify uh, potential therapeutic areas where this technology uh, may have uh, some benefits. The topic outlined is as follows. Uh, first, we'll, uh, we'll provide a foundation with regards to oxygen exchange and oxygen delivery. Uh, and then we'll, we'll focus in on some research topics, really focusing on two areas, the, the uh, assessment of ventilation, and then second, uh, sec secondarily, uh, the assessment of pulmonary embolism. And then lastly, we will open up the, the uh, presentation for a Q&A. So let's move on into the, uh, the first part, which is more foundational. We'll be focusing on the physiology, oxygen exchange, and oxygen delivery. So if you want to break down oxygen exchange, it needs to be broken down into the most basic uh, uh, basic unit to understand the principle across the entire lung. And the easiest way to do that is to describe the alveolar unit. The graphic to your right provides a visualization of the alveolar unit uh, where you have the ability to identify the inflow and outflow of both oxygen and CO2. And as it traverses across the capillary, uh, coming from the pulmonary artery, uh, undergoing oxygen exchange within uh, the alveolar unit and then uh, through the pulmo uh, pulmonary vein to return back to the heart for circulation. So simply, simply stated, oxygen flows from the alveolus into the capillary and, and then the opposite uh, mo movement, CO2 will move from the capillary into the alveolus. Very, found, very foundational. Interestingly enough, um, the diffusion capabilities between oxygen and CO2 are different. Uh, CO2 diffuses quite rapidly, while oxygen is more gradual. Therefore, if you're rem rem remembering the graphic to, uh, on the previous slide, CO2 equilibration occurs earlier or to that bottom left area of, uh, of the alveolar unit, while oxygen uh, diffusion occurs more gradually. And uh, the, the, uh, the information to your right uh, gives you a sense that you know, a partial pressure difference of five millimeters of CO2 will result in a similar amount of equilibration or, or uh, gas uh, uh, transfer as that of oxygen with a uh, partial pressure difference in excess of 60 millimeters. So that gives you a sense of how big um, the difference is in terms of diffusion capabilities between these two gases. Moving along to oxygen delivery. <clears throat> so once the uh, we, we leave the alveolar unit, the capillary leaving the alveolar unit coalesces into the uh, uh, into the pulmonary vein and then delivers into the heart. Oxygenated blood will then get distributed, uh, and it gets distributed through the aorta. And at the three o'clock position, you will see the arterial oxygen content, also known as SAO2. Uh, oh. The easiest way uh, to evaluate that. Uh, clinically is either from our arterial blood gas uh, or uh, non-invasively through uh, SpO2, which serves as a, uh, as a strong correlate of that same measure. As the blood tra travels down and gets delivered to the, uh, to the tissue bed, oxygen will get extracted. The delivery of oxygen to the tissue bed is quantified as oxygen delivery, and it's a simple calculation of the cardiac output as well as the arterial oxygen content. As, and then now at the six o'clock position, as oxygen is being diffused across the capillary and being consumed, there is a certain level of extraction ratio and there is a certain level of consumption. And there's a relationship between oxygen extraction ratio, the oxygen delivery and, uh, and oxygen consumption. Once the blood is now returning back as venous circulation back to the heart to repeat this entire process, you will have SVO2, which is the, the venous surrogate of SAO2. Uh, and that is another uh, means to be able to measure the adequacy of oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. But, ba but uh, boiling it down into its simplest terms, there needs to be a balance between the delivery of oxygen, 
Uh, and then the, the flip side is uh, the, uh, matching that with regards to the consumption of oxygen or DO2 and VO2 balance. Moving into some research topics, so that is the, 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 the foundational principles of uh, oxygen delivery uh, and oxygen exchange. Let's go into uh, the discussion on ventilation assessment. So current, current practices uh, in the emergency department and the operating room and, and other uh, acute care environments will rely on pulse oximetry and end tidal CO2 to be able to uh, perform ventilation ass assessments. Uh, both are, are non-invasive and both are continuous, uh, which is advantageous um, for the ambulatory population. Um, it is important to understand that under the the print uh, under the the uh, the conditions where hypoventilation are occurring, it is understood that there will be changes in SpO2 and end tidal CO2. N namely, as ventilation decreases, ultimately there will be a decreased change in SpO2, where SpO2 will drop uh, below 90% and can be uh, quite profoundly lower than that. Uh, it, and uh, in addition to that, the CO2 will gradually climb uh, as hypoventilation continues. Um, interestingly enough, and you'll uh, uh, understand that in, in a couple of slides, that these measures are not as sensitive or time sensitive compared to um, uh, uh, utility of end tidal oximetry. So Linko and uh, pa Paolo Mayo uh, have done some, uh, some fundamental research uh, several years ago now uh, on the topic of ventilation assessment. To start off on the left with regards to hypoventilation, uh, in individuals that had their minute ventilation reduced, you understand that the amount of uh, gas exchange that is occurring at the alveolar unit is decreased. Uh, uh, so therefore, the total oxygen that enters and the total CO2 that leaves the alveolar unit are negatively affected or they're decreased. What will occur uh, if you are measuring end tidal oxygen, and that's what uh, the Linko study did, they measured end tidal oxygen and noticed that it decreased as minute ventilation was reduced. Um, similarly, as we talked uh, on a previous slide, the end tidal CO2 increased. Um, there is a, uh, a, uh, a note of the oxygen gradient here uh, showing that it's increased. Just simply we'll focus on the oxygen gradient in a little bit more detail, but at, at a high level, understanding that the oxygen gradient is a simple calculation, is the difference between the FiO2 uh, and, and that of the uh, end tidal O2. So as FiO2 is fixed, uh, end tidal O2 changes up or down, the difference between those two will be will can be in a, a clinically informative value, with one caveat. Typically, uh, the studies have been done with Linko and others that the oxygen gradient is is most robust when the FiO2 uh, is 60% or less. So, if you're on 100% oxygen, it becomes uh, un unreliable. As an example, so. Flipping the gears to hyperventilation, the same thing in the opposite will occur. Minute ventilation means uh, you, it's uh, sorry, hyperventilation occurs, and minute ventilation is increased. So that positively affects uh, the gas exchange at the alveolar unit, which means that the total amount of oxygen entering and the total amount of CO2 leaving have both increased. Uh, therefore, that would manifest as the entail oxygen has increased, entail CO2 naturally would decrease, and. Uh, uh, on the flip side, the oxygen gradient now has decreased. So these measurements, the entail oxygen as well as the oxygen gradient, can be informative to identify people that are going through bouts of hyper or hypoventilation. Uh, we talked about the oxygen gradient uh, again, um, and interestingly, uh, the follow-on study that was done by Linko um, in, in humans uh, looked at the changes in the oxygen gradient compared to changes in end tidal CO2 and changes in SpO2 dur during periods of both hypoventilation and hyperventilation. And interestingly enough, that the oxygen gradient changed faster, so it was a much more early uh, predictor or uh, uh, not predictor, uh, an earlier um, signal that changes in minute ventilation are occurring uh, where 
The next one that is uh, to change uh, and to inform the clinician would be end tidal CO2. And the last one, not surprising, would be the SpO2. So therefore, um, under periods of hypoventilation, the oxygen gradient would increase. And then the flip side, uh, as I said on the previous slide, uh, during periods of hyperventilation, the oxygen uh, gradient would decrease. So clearly one, one could surmise, uh, is, is there opportunity to use this as a uh, monitoring tool of patients uh, possibly undergoing weaning? Uh, could it be uh, used for uh, impending respiratory compromise? You know, we're all concerned about uh, coronavirus at present time affecting um, uh, oxygen exchange. So is there potential that the oxygen gradient can help to risk stratify these patients, whether they're weaning or, or they're uh, COVID positive and wondering whether or not they may need a higher level of oxygen support in the future? Just questions, uh, questions that can be asked uh, now and answered in the future. <clears throat> so with regards to the change in the direction, so the change in entitled tidal oxygen uh, were found to be uh, quicker than, than end tidal CO2, as I said before, uh, so that the oxygen gradient was uh, uh, summarized or concluded that it is a more sensitive in indicator of hypoventilation than either end tidal CO2 and SpO2. So Pot uh, potential applications. Now, there hasn't been uh, any research on this, but people that have impending respiratory uh, issues, uh, being able to monitor the oxygen gradient, provided that, that they're not on high levels of, of FiO2, can be uh, potentially advantageous to further risk stratify these patients. Second topic is with regard to the pulmonary embolism, and I think that there has been a, a little bit of a, a little bit more evidence uh, in, in here that shows that the um, entel oxygen can be uh, useful as a, a supportive diagnostic tool. Uh, and let's get that get into that in a few minutes. So first off, the entel oximetry um, uh, picture is really boiled down once again to the alveolar unit under pulmonary embolism. Here. The, the graphic representation on the right is, is focusing on two alveolar units where one has a shunt present. So therefore, that alveolar unit is not contributing to oxygen or CO2 exchange. So therefore, there is a uh, retention of oxygen within the alveolus, and there is a relative decrease uh, representation of CO2 in the alveolus. alveolus as well. One of the most common conditions that causes a shunt is pulmonary embolism. There are others, but pulmonary embolism uh, is certainly something that is front and center of people uh, when they're concerned of chest pain and they may be short of breath. Um, what you see with the graphic to the right is in the presence of a shunt, what can happen is that the changes in the uh, entile oxygen will increase Oxygen, oxygen exchange has been negatively affected. So a certain, a, a small amount of oxygen retain, uh, remains in the alveolus. And the, depending on the amount of shunt, the, the magnitude of change to the entile uh, oxygen uh, can be uh, quite large. Uh, in contrast, the entile CO2 will decrease. So therefore there are some, uh, uh, some uh, utility uh, from a from a foundational standpoint, that entitled oximetry and entitled CO two have some in, uh, benefit in pulmonary embolism. So, as as I said before, uh, but just to uh, to reiterate, so in in the presence of a pulmonary embolism or a suspected pulmonary embolism, the there will be an increase in in the entitled oxygen, while there will be a decrease in the entitled CO two. One of the questions that was uh, posed by uh, Paoletti uh, is, is there any relevance of a ratio between the end tidal CO2 and the end tidal oxygen? Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in a sec. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Klein, uh, uh, now back in 2006 at Carolina's Medical Center, actually did a study on this, looked at varying uh, various respiratory parameters in patients uh, that were suspected of having pulmonary embolisms. Interestingly enough, the, um, the lines uh, highlighted in yellow in the bottom are showing that the end tidal CO2 to end tidal O2 ratios uh, or fractions, there was a statistically significant difference 
between those patients that had a pulmonary embolism versus those that that uh, did not have a pulmonary embolism. Interestingly enough, um, and uh, in each of these scenarios, period one, period two, period three, are re representing uh, episodes of tidal breathing. That means tidal breathing that is being measured over a 30 second period. The ratios, if you notice, are relatively consistent across them, but there is a break. In patients with a pulmonary embolism, that ratio of PCO2 to PO2 is uh, is less, while those uh, patients that have a PE uh, that do not have a PE have a ratio that is um, uh, higher. And uh, there was uh, uh, test sensitivities for a cutoff of 0.4, and that sensitivity for a pulmonary embolism was identified to be greater than 95%. And interestingly, receiver operator operator characteristic curves were also plotted uh, for this ratio, and they're quite strong at 0.88. Interestingly enough, there hasn't been uh, any follow-on uh, articles in this regard, but the, the, the art of pulmonary embolism uh, still requires the understanding of pretest probability. And this uh, research helps to illustrate that this can be uh, added into the uh, medical decision-making for uh, suspecting pulmonary embolism in uh, the appropriate patient, patient population. And on, on that note, uh, I'll highlight the, uh, the references uh, that were uh, used, LINCO uh, two studies and the one by Jeff Klein, uh, once again, from the United States and California. And on that note, I will uh, conclude the presentation. I appreciate the interest and attention, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you.